It's been a crazy year with real estate. And in this video, we're gonna cover off the top questions that RICO, which is the Real Estate Council of Ontario, gets from buyers and sellers during this crazy real estate market. And stay tuned till the end because we're gonna cover off the top five and I'm gonna go into some details of my own. And those top five cover everything from multiple offers to how we handle COVID. So let's get to it. Hi everybody, my name is Connie Sarvanandan and I'm a real estate agent here in Toronto. And if this is your first time to the channel, welcome. We are all about education. So this channel is all about educating you. So when you're ready to buy or sell real estate, you feel informed. So if you have any questions about real estate, moving to Toronto, living in Toronto, buying or selling real estate in Toronto, feel free to reach out and we'll be sure to take care of you. So let's get straight to this article and cover off the top five questions that buyers and sellers have. Okay, as most of you know who have been to the channel before, I love showing you guys articles um, that I have read and that have come out um, just on real estate in Toronto, the GTA, Ontario, and Canada. Um, so for this one, we're going to be looking at the Toronto Star and in uh, last year's red hot real estate market, these were the top five questions from buyers and sellers. And um, it's being answered by Joe Richer, which who is the registrar for the Real Estate Council of Ontario. So the Real Estate Council of Ontario, that is our um, that is our uh, the, it, it's part of the government, and that is who I'm responsible to as far as my licensing goes. So everything about my licensing is through the Re, uh, RICO we call it, and that's the Real Estate Council of Ontario. Um, and so everything from getting my license to keeping my license to insurance, to all those things, that's all done through RICO. So let's get to the top five questions. So the first question is as a home buyer, what can I expect when there are competing offers on a home? And so this is, um, we're going to cover off first. Uh, the answer from Rico, and then I'm just going to add in my own two cents. So during the bidding war, the listing brokerage must disclose the number of active offers on a property, whether any buyers are represented by the listing brokerage, whether any offers include an adjustment to the commission the seller would pay um, by the buyer's brokerage, and then these disclosures help ensure a level playing field for all buyers. The seller can then accept or reject your offer or make a counter offer or even give more buyers the opportunity to improve their offers. So what is all of this saying? Well, first of all, if there are competing offers as a listing agent, so I'm the listing, if I'm the person who has the house for sale, I'm the listing agent. And as the listing agent, I need to let you know if there's other offers. And if there are other offers, how many offers there are. But I don't need to let you know any of the details of the other offers. I just need to tell you if there are other offers and how many there are. The next thing that I need to do, uh, make sure everybody knows if any of the buyers are represented by the listing brokerage. So if there is, because I'm the listing agent, if there are any buyers that are being represented by my brokerage, I need to also let all the buyers know that just so that everybody's aware because there, um, we call it multiple representation and everybody has to be aware of that. And then the final thing is whether any offers include an adjustment to the commission that the seller would pay by the buyer's brokerage. So this is really saying if, you know, an offer is coming in and there's some sort of adjustment to the commission, whether the listing agent is doing it, whether a buying agent is doing it, then um, uh, as the listing agent, I would have to tell everybody that. But I will say in practice, most of the time, um, when it's a it's a multiple listing a multiple listing situation, we don't allow adjustments in commission because you don't want 
it, we just don't allow it. So they say no adjustments in commission. So everybody has to uh, be the same. And the reason why we do all of this is letting you know how many offers and um, letting you know if there's any conflicts as far as uh, representation goes is to even out the playing field so that when the seller gets all of these offers, they're not trying to figure out, oh, well, this one has a reduced commission or, oh, this one's coming from the same place. No, everything is on the, uh, everything is exposed and so, and then everything is leveled out as much as possible so then the seller can make the decision on what the best offer is for them. And there's lots of different reasons why a seller will think an offer is best for them. It could be price, it could be the closing date, it could be all kinds of other things. Uh, it's really up to the seller. Now, if there's multiple offers, the seller gets to decide what they do with that. So they can, if you are submitting an offer, they can accept your offer, they can reject your offer, or they might, uh, there might be offers that are close and they might come back to you and ask you if you want to change your offer, which usually means do you want to improve your offer in ever, any way? So those are the options that the seller has. Now, the one thing is that, um, uh, this happens a lot in Toronto uh, right now, um, and this is what we call a seller's market because this is happening a lot. But if you ever hear a buyer's market, that's when there's more sellers than buyers, but right now there's more buyers than sellers, and so there's a lot more activity and a lot more people bidding at houses. So that's the first thing. So let's go to the second question we were involved in competing bids on a home and the seller accepted an offer that was lower than ours doesn't the seller have to accept the highest offer the answer is the sellers are not required to choose the highest priced offer other factors can influence decisions such as the size of deposit the closing date and other terms and conditions they prefer so you know the price is just one aspect of it when it comes to what the seller wants. So if a seller picks an offer that's lower in price, maybe the highest priced offer had a, um, a condition, a home inspection or a financing condition, or maybe the highest price offer didn't have the right closing date and they weren't flexible, or maybe the highest price offer had a, had a really low deposit so the seller wasn't convinced that they would have the funds to close the transaction. You don't know. So what you do is you bring in your best offer, whatever that means, and then it's up to the seller to decide. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's just based on price. For sellers, there's a lot of other motivations and oftentimes conditions, uh, things like conditions or uh, closing dates can make a big difference. The third biggest question was, what's the difference between listing price and sales price and why are they so often different? So this is the answer. In years past, the asking or listing price was generally a close estimate of what the home was worth and the selling price would end up being very close to the asking price. However, in today's hot housing market, the list price becomes more often being used as a marketing tool to generate interest in a property. A seller has the legal right to set the asking price at whatever amount they believe is best for selling the home. RICO does not regulate the decisions of sellers and buyers. So what this means is in years past, if a home was you know, going to sell at around a million dollars, Somebody would list the home for a 999,000 and it would sell for a million dollars or plus minus. In today's market, if a home is going to sell for a million dollars, oftentimes what you'll find is it'll be listed for 800,000. And that's done on purpose to generate interest and um and as a marketing tool for that home. Now, the the selling price is always determined by the seller. Uh, we as real estate agents make recommendations and then the seller decides if they want to follow those recommendations or not. But that's what they're saying that uh, the asking price or the list price is not necessarily 
reflective of what the sold price is. So you can have a, pr a property that's listed for 800000 and it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to sell for 800000 It could sell for a million dollars depending on what it's actually sold for. So list price is what it's actually listed for and sold price is what it's actually sold for. Um, so hopefully that clarifies that. The fourth most asked question is, we are first time, bu first time buyers frustrated by the current real estate market. What advice or tips do you have for us? So his answer is, first, interview a few real estate agents and choose the one who best understands your needs. Ste second, manage your emotions and make sure you know what you want or need in a property and stick to what you are prepared to pay. Third, if you want to submit an offer without any conditions, be sure you're comfortable with taking that risk as it can have significant repercussions. And fourth, the, the real estate contracts are legal documents, so you read and understand everything before you sign and get legal advice. So I'm going to go through each one of those points just to make sure everybody's clear on what exactly they mean. The first is interview a few real estate agents and choose one who best understands your needs. I think this is so critical that you you pick a real estate agent who's really going to get you. Um, and you should interview two or three of them to make sure that first of all, you feel comfortable with them because they are leading you through this process and you have to trust them and feel like they are looking after your best interests. So interview a few, make sure that your styles match. I'm not going to be the perfect real estate agent for everybody. Um, and that's okay. You got to pick who makes sense for you. So ask the same questions to all of them. See how they respond. See if they are the right match for you. So for example, if you are a really analytical person and you ask a lot of numbers questions and you get a real estate agent that may not be a numbers person, then they may not be the best fit for you. So that's what I mean by just make sure that they are the right kind of uh, match for you that they're going to answer the questions the way you liked them answered and you feel like you you um, can talk to them and ask them anything that they want. Um, the second is manage your emotions and make sure you know what you want to what you want to need in a property and stick to what you are prepared to pay. The thing about this market, especially for buyers, is oftentimes you can make multiple offers and not get a house. And so what you have to do is you have to be very clear about how much you want to spend and what you're willing to spend so that you don't make an emotional decision when it comes to a house. You don't want to get to a third offer and say, I really want a house and I'm going to pay whatever and I'm going to forego on all of these things because you can get into, uh, you may get into a situation where you're not happy because you overpaid or you um, can't afford it or you didn't do an inspection on something that you really wanted to. You can bypass all of that if that's what you want, but you should know that ahead of time before getting caught in the emotion of that actual offer process. You should understand all of that beforehand. Third, submit if you want to submit an offer without any conditions, be comfortable that you are taking the risk and it can have significant repercussions. So this one is really interesting because, you know, when I think about some of the conditions, it could be a home inspection or it could be a financing condition. And so, you know, a lot of times in multiple offer situations, the seller is going to take somebody who has the least amount of conditions or zero conditions. So... If you're going to waive conditions, that's okay, but you have to understand what those risks are when you waive conditions. So if you are waiving a finance condition, then you should be very comfortable in whatever price that you are going, you are bidding on that you can finance that price. So maybe you'll have cash, maybe you'll have the bank has pre-approved you for higher, whatever the case may be. But do not think, especially for financing, if you bid on a house, that the bank is going to give you money for that amount. The bank is going to do their own assessment on the value of that house, and they're going to give you um, their mortgage based on what they believe the value of the house is. And the value of the house is either what it's sold for or what the appraisal is, and it's the lower of the two amounts. So if you, you know, 
bought a house that what every other house in the neighborhood sold for a million dollars and then you bought this house and you paid 1.4 million you have to be prepared that the bank might say actually we're only going to give you a million because that's what the neighbor sold for last week um and you're going to have to figure out the remaining 400,000 or maybe the bank will give you more or maybe you go to a private lender or maybe you have other ways of um supplementing that but don't assume just because you decide to go to 1.4 when everything else has sold for a million that the bank is going to agree to that. Oftentimes they won't. So that's the first thing. The other thing is um, um, home inspections. Home inspections are great, but a lot of times, you know, in multiple offers, you may not be able to uh, get one in. And again, it's really about your comfort level on if something goes wrong. So if you don't do a home inspection, and you're at a property that has a well or a septic, are you comfortable with wells and septic to understand what it means if there's something wrong with it? What if it's the water? What if it's, you know, the size? What if it's the age? Those are the kind of things that, you know, your real estate agent should also provide you with great advice, but you really have to be comfortable with what you're taking on when you say you're not taking on a home inspection. Um, the then we talk about um the fourth is real estate contracts and legal documents the whole process is legal documents not only should you understand what you're signing but you should understand what your responsibility is once you sign and what you are responsible when you make an offer so you know it's not like you can make an offer on a house and then take it back once you've signed the document that is a legal offer and it's legally binding binding if that person accepts it so you need to be really clear on what all the documents are and then on top of that you should also um, have a lawyer that is available to ask further questions if it's more complicated or there's things that you want to understand so for sure um, you have to take the responsibility of understanding all the documents and making sure that whoever you're working with you feel comfortable that they're explaining the documents to you and exactly what you're signing. Um, and if they don't understand, then they have resources for you to get that information. Okay, and then the fifth and final th question that gets asked, these are the top five questions, is in this pandemic, how can I protect myself while viewing homes? Brokerages and salespeople must follow public health guidelines and safety protocols when showing a home. Many brokerages offer virtual sh showings to maximize the number of buyers seeing a property while limiting in-person visits to those who are particularly interested. As a seller, you can request a limit to the number of visitors doing all viewings, insist that no one displaying sy symptoms is allowed inside, and also provide specific instructions to reduce the touching of surfaces amongst other protocols. As a prospective buyer, you should make sure you wear a mask and use hand sanitizer as you enter the home. And honestly, it's really a, uh, so for almost all the homes we've seen, I've always had to sign a COVID waiver. When I have a listing, I make everybody sign a COVID waiver, basically saying like, you know, going through all the symptoms, making sure you're symptom free. When people enter into my, any of my homes that I have listed, or I bring buyers into any homes, I tell them to minimize touch at, uh, at all costs. So if you don't need to touch something, don't do it. So do not you know, open anything, touch anything, you know, just l try and go through the house without touching as little, by touching as little as possible. And of course there's masks and hand sanitizers and everything else. And, you know, we as realtors, we really are guided by, um, the regulation. So, you know, when it's a proper time, we can have open houses, but, and when it's not, we can't. And when it comes to showings, you know, there's no double bookings. There's not a lot of people allowed inside. There's lots of ways to mitigate any, any kind of risk that comes with COVID. Of course, it's not perfect, but it, we're definitely following all the rules and guidelines that are set out by the Canadian, uh, Ontario government. So, Ontario regulates us and all, Ontario also sets up what we can and cannot do. So anything that happens is really, when it comes to real estate, is really, um, we're following the directive of the Ontario government. 
So those are the questions. I hope that some of those questions were questions that you had on your mind. And of course, if you have questions that weren't in that list, I would love to hear it and I'm happy to talk about them and take you through them. Um, my name is Connie Sarvanandan. Thank you for watching. And if you have any questions about real estate in Toronto, the GTA, Ontario, or Canada, feel free to reach out, call, text, email, or WhatsApp, and we will be sure to get back to you. If this is your first time to the channel, please like and subscribe. It really helps us out. And also, if you have any comments, good or bad, please let us know because that helps us determine what kind of videos we should be making. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.